everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webcast. We are here to talk today about API security best practices. And uh, let me introduce our speakers for today. We have Joel Dessa and Matt Bloomberg. They both work for Google Cloud's Apigee API management platform. Joel is on the engineering side. He's a security tech lead. And Matt is a product manager. So without further ado, I'm willing to turn it over to our speakers. Great. Thank you, Shika. So good morning, everybody. We're going to start off just a quick agenda, start off with some overview of the power of APIs and what impact they can have on your business, why they're important. We'll discuss a little bit about how API visibility can have a significant impact from a security perspective. The architecture that was commonly used in the past and some future trends we're seeing, Joel's going to present on that, as well as the uh, general best practices around how to secure your APIs. So to give a little, start with a little bit of history, APIs have been around for about 20 years. In the early 2000s, APIs were first used by companies like Amazon and eBay, who were noticing unofficial usage of their services and data. These companies were looking for a way to provide structure to their developers and partners in a supportable and scalable way. And what we're seeing today is that APIs are everywhere, and they're a key enabler for innovation as they facilitate new ways of interacting with partners developers, and customers. APIs can enable you to connect systems that have never been connected before and enable new use cases for your business, such as everything from voice ordering with the Google Assistant to social login for your customers. And it helps move brick and mortar retailers into the e-commerce world. To share a couple data points on, on Walgreens use case for APIs, they have more than 8,000 locations and they're leveraging APIs to drive additional customers to their stores. One example is that Fitbit is using their store locator API to help customers find a Walgreens location and make a purchase with Fitbit Pay. Another example is they have hundreds of partners that are using their photo print API that allow for same day photo printing in these third party apps. And that also allows them to do a rev share with those partners. So now we're just gonna take a look at one of Brazil's uh, largest retailers, Magazine Luiza. This is a company that has been around for more than 60 years and has more than 900 locations. And they realize that it's not only about the physical stores anymore. APIs have enabled them to scale to thousands of delivery partners and increase their product catalog by 30x. So going from 50,000 products to more than 1.5 million, this has, enabled, this has been enabled by more than 2,000 merchants that are now supporting and selling products on their e-commerce platform. And as you can see here, the sales and financial impact this has had on their business is, is really incredible. When security is an afterthought, you're more likely to let a misconfiguration move into production, and it puts a lot of data at risk. A lot of the data that's being exposed today is extremely valuable. Information such as payment information, bank accounts, credit cards, PII, PHI. Proper API security requires there to be visibility and awareness, along with accountability for all of the data that is exposed. And while creating and hosting an API is an important component, a full lifecycle API management platform is needed in order to enable for data to be, data to be exposed in a secure way. Apigee provides a complete API management platform and to give you a quick overview of the three primary components, the developer management aspect provides developers the ability to scale your API program with developers by allowing it to have the consumer audience in a managed way. It allows you to package and monetize your API services as well. The API analytics component gives you insights into your API program and helps you measure and tune uh, that program as services are exposed. And the API services piece allows you to manage the connection between the API consumer and the backend service, and it gives you complete control over the request and the response. So just to give a quick example from Google Maps, in this example, I'm searching for a hotel in San Francisco for a couple weeks from now, and I'm able to choose dates. I'm able to view room availability and book the room. And I can also see live pricing data from the hotel directly in, this, uh, in, in the Maps interface. And I can book the room through, through this interface or through their booking partners. So this has enabled hotels to offer a deep level of integration with Google Maps and thousands of additional travel sites. It allows companies to now offer dynamic pricing based on availability with updates to the pricing in real time without any manual updates uh, across multiple web properties. So between Walgreens and Magazine Louisa, Google Maps, I've given a few examples of where APIs are powering business innovation. And in many cases, this has led to market disruption. But disruption is not always a good thing. <clears throat> when security is an afterthought, 
sometimes enterprises don't take the right precautions before exposing their APIs. And in many cases, simply the lack of awareness to what is exposed and what access controls are in place can lead to, can lead to issues. So just to give an example of, of what happened with the US Postal Service, they were excited to offer a new service for businesses to allow them to track mail campaigns in real time. But the issue they had really breaks into two pieces. They had a misconfigured API that allowed for wildcard input, and they had a lack of visibility into what data was exposed. So this, the configuration allowed for any user to view any other user's data, such as email address, phone number, other PII, and they also could make changes to it. This misconfiguration was much more harmful than a single user's account being hacked. And in this particular case, more than 60 million users' data was exposed for several months. And this could have been, been avoided if they had the proper OAuth scopes configured and proper input validation in place. And while you may not be able to prevent every misconfiguration from in every scenario, this is again another reason why visibility is, is critically important. So this is not any, you know, just specifically focused on the Postal Service. You know, an article recently showing that there were more than 4,000 breaches reported last year. And, this, and outside of the EU, there's no requirement for any company to report the breach. So um, the, the, the real number is likely an order of magnitude higher. So it really boils down to the fact that you can't secure what you can't see. And some companies manage some APIs and not others, but the goal here is to have clear visibility into what risks exist within your organization and have the ability to audit what has changed. Understanding how your services are performing, what insider threats exist, what anomalies you're seeing in your traffic, these are all critical aspects to a successful API program. And some APIs are more prone to attacks because of the way their infrastructure is architected, and Joel's gonna to touch on that in a little while. But every API does not face the same security challenges, but gaining visibility into these rates of attacks and the latency of responses and the behavior of these APIs and how it impacts the backend infrastructure will better educate you and your teams on how to respond if something does happen. So Apogee's taking a two-prong approach to visibility. Today, we're offering insights to meet the needs of both operations and security teams. Today, users expect to have 100% service availability. According to some Google research from 2017, 53% of users will leave a mobile page if it takes longer than three seconds to load. So from an operations perspective, you always want to identify issues before your customers do. As you can see here, Apogee offers clear insights into where requests are coming from, the latency uh, analysis and custom reports. And obviously it's far better to be alerted about a high latency issue on your backend infrastructure than an alert due to a drop in page views or app installs or customer support escalations. For many of our customers, security issues are initially detected as operations issues. For example, a large spike in traffic could be a good thing. Maybe there's a flash sale or you're offering tickets and they're released at a certain time. But if it's not expected, it may be a concern and you need to know about it. So Apogee allows you to take actions based on contextual alerts before consumers are impacted. And by leveraging Apogee fault codes, you can quickly isolate problem areas to speed up the diagnosis. The second aspect is around security and Apogee stores the data that security admins need in various parts of our platform today. We've been seeing an increase, an increasing trend of collaboration between operations and security teams where they work together to investigate and track down security and privacy related issues. So we wanted to make that information more easily accessible with an at a glance view. And today we're excited to announce a new API security reporting tool that offers two new ways to access your security data, both in the form of a dashboard as you can get a preview here and as an API, which will allow for integration with your existing SIM tools. This is an alpha today and will be available more broadly in Q2. If we take a look back at some of the most recent data breaches, many of these organizations had a clear view of their security and ops data. If, if they had the uh, insight into their security and ops data, several red flags would have, would have jumped out uh, long before external researchers discovered and reported, notify them about these issues. Our security reporting tool will be offering everything from changes in data to certificate information, policy and configuration data for each proxy. There's more than 50 data elements that will be included in this tool. Um, and while having this level of visibility is really important, the security of the underlying architecture is equally as important. So I'm gonna hand this over to Joel, who's gonna walk you through additional API security best practices and architectural uh, best practices as well on how to keep your data secure. 
Thanks, Matt. Just by way of introduction, I worked on enterprise security problems for the last 10 years, and more recently at Apogee. Um, APIs are a key part of an enterprise's security infrastructure. And I was hoping to share my perspective on API security today and perhaps provide some direction for where things are headed. So security is a broad field. Uh, there's a lot of things to consider, uh, many things to think about at the same time, and wrestling with all of them together is rather challenging. What we have found uh, to be a more effective method to defend against security threats is to use metrics and data to understand specifically the problems that your APIs face and then tailor threats to those, to those uh, tailor your responses to those, to those threats. So once you have your data laid out as Matt has described, you will need to tackle these threats that your APIs face. And what you will find is that you know, most of the threats that APIs face are very similar to those that traditional software applications face. So these range, range from basic software bugs, you know, for example, authorization issues that Equifax as well as USPS faced, uh, improper password storage, uh, things like LinkedIn faced and recently Facebook reported, and also simple issues like maybe a random number generator that's not random, or you might have injection issues. These are issues that typically web applications face. Things like cross-site scripting, or SQL injection, remote code execution. There are also service availability issues. These are things that are easy to create, a denial of service attack, which sometimes is malicious. But on the other hand, could be from a partner or a buggy application that you rolled up. There are uh, threats to the user's identity, wherein there are credential databases that are out there today that are open source. So anyone can use those credential databases to attack users of your API. There's also a growing list of threats from insiders. These are people that are internal to your API program that for whatever reason may want to you know, look at analytics or perhaps stop traffic. Or it just could be an employee whose account has been compromised. And last but not the least, spam and abuse. Uh, this is being faced by a lot of social networks out today and also will impact your API. So let's talk about like basic software issues. You know, just like with any application, if you want to improve its security, you want to start with a very strong foundation. Things like, you know, just good code or a good design, code reviews, things like good tests. This will ensure that you're able to identify security bugs and roll them into production quickly. Also security reviews that ensure that security bugs found in one part of your API program um, are not found and again in another part of API. Then there are a lot of secure software development stacks. Some uh, stacks are more secure than others. So when you start to deploy all of these, you need to go with your eyes open, be aware of the challenges that your software development stack faces, and be prepared to fix them and roll them out. A lot of security issues are found by your customers or well-meaning users. You want to have a place for them to reach out, file those issues, for you to build a process that will allow the issues to be triaged, fixed, and rolled into production quickly. We found that third-party penetration tests are a great way to illuminate any blind spots in your security approach or your, or your posture. And having consistent change management processes is also important. Understanding what changes are happening, who's making them, why are they being made, and who's approving these changes. One of the ways to look at this is to actually draw a threat model of your architecture. A threat model, um, there are many tools out there, but it's similar to a diagram that you see here. It will allow you to just map out your application and look at all these different idea, uh, items around software development and allow you to prioritize you know, which ones need to be fixed first, depending on, on the threats that they face. Again, we're trying to um, you know, show some of this data in the dashboard. One of the most simple things we found that people can do to fix their API security that has a broad impact is actually just input validation. One of the customers we spoke to at Telecom was very focused on sort of DDoS type attacks and had not prioritized sort of these basic things like input validation. And a single malicious payload was able to compromise their entire, uh, you know, or, or rather subset of their customer list, which wasn't great. One of the things to think about in input validation is consistency. So if you look on the diagram on the left, if name, tag, and status are you know, all strings, you might want to use the same input validation library to validate them. 
APIs that way are different than traditional software applications or traditional web applications. Unlike traditional web applications where there is a whole host of input and headers and things like that you can send in, with APIs, you have a very specific input and output. It's, it's in an API specification that's, that's defined on the right there. And so if you build common libraries, then you, know, you will have a consistent boundary around your service. I think about your office building, if all the doors look different, an attacker would literally go and try every door to try and break in. But if all the doors look the same, you know, your chances of being canned or tried probed for internet breaches is sort of probably lower. So this is something worth, worth thinking about. API gateways like Apogee provide a whole host of, of libraries or regular expressions that you could use to validate input and something that you should deploy. One of the most common questions we get from customers is how to defend against volumetric attacks, that is DDoS type situations or buggy clients or things of that nature. And your most effective defense primarily is actually scaling out. And uh, the reason for that is if your infrastructure is able to survive a denial of service attack, all the attacker needs to do is just ramp up the traffic. Your goal in any of these exercises is to make sure that the API backend is protected. That is, it does not have to handle junk or volume traffic from a client directly. Google Cloud, as well as Google, have been defending internal Google infrastructure from denial of service issues for many years. And you could deploy some of this infrastructure for, for your application as well. Google load balancers elastically scale and are able to handle layer three and below threats. The Google network backbone has multiple levels of load balancers that are den denial of service aware and are able to sense an incoming attack and drop traffic before it even hits your backend. Apogee's API management provides application level uh, denial of service protection. The API rate limiting policy will allow you to smooth out any spikes in traffic from malicious as well as buggy clients. Distributed encrypted caches will allow you to protect your backend by serving up frequent responses to requests that are, that are frequent from clients. Our resource quota service will allow you to enforce quotas on apps and partners so that you can uh, limit the traffic that they send you. But by far, one of the things that you could do to have the most impact on your security is actually to protect the users of your API. Now, this area has been undergoing a lot of changes recently. And there are a lot of different variations in the architecture. I'd like to walk you through a little bit of a history lesson in, in how this has evolved and hopefully provide some direction for where this needs to go. So in the mid 1990s, most websites were very simple. They were static web pages deployed to a container and served up content from a data store or a database. Even today, most static content is served up exactly this way they protected using a standard network parameter. As websites started to grow and the internet started to become more popular, data tiers were deployed to these same containers and they were protected using the same parameter. At this point, there was user input. Users were logging in. They would exchange their credentials for cookies. Then reusable data components started to get deployed to the same container. If you look at the diagram here, think about this as one pod of deployments that are serving traffic from a particular region. In order to scale out this infrastructure, multiple pods of the same infrastructure were deployed on a worldwide basis, all protected using a network perimeter. And if any of you are familiar with it, there was a concept of sticky sessions. Sticky sessions allowed, if, uh, allowed for a design for which if a user hit a particular pod of the infrastructure, all requests from the user would go to the same pod and the sessions were stored within that same infrastructure. And obviously as scale increased, the data and logic tiers using at that time EJBs were scaled separately from the web tier, the serving tier. If any of you worked on WebSphere or WebLogic, you're very familiar probably with this kind of an architecture. Now this is where things started to break a little bit. Sort of mobile changed a lot of it, as well as the evolution of stateless UIs. If most of you have gone to airline uh, websites to book tickets, sort of in the mid 2000s, you would have this disconnected experience where when you're booking the ticket, you have a fantastic experience where you're logging through this mobile app and the, and the website looks amazing and everything's very fluid. 
and then you go to check flight status, and this this one next 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 page that you have to go through. It's a very disconnected experience, but that was caused because of this shift to mobile and the shift to actually what was stateless UIs, AJAX-based UIs. That was that was interesting, but the more disconnected experience was on the security side, where traditional websites use cookies, but mobile apps use API services and tokens. Now throughout this entire you know, transition the security model actually hadn't changed. It was still a parameter-based model. You would exchange your user credentials for cookies. Cookies were tied to some session attributes. And all these credentials and cookies were stored within the same parameter. It was literally stored sometimes on the same JVM. And parameter models were good, right? Uh, they helped give peace of mind, defend your infrastructure you know, in, when there was an attack, prevent the breach from being from spreading beyond the walls of the perimeter and enforce consistency. So this was good. Recent studies have shown that almost half of enterprises, and I'm sure most of the, of the people on this call, are actually deploying microservices as the old architectures start to fade away. One thing to note here, in an older application server style model, the applications were deployed into the server. But in microservices, the server is deployed into the application. So while in an older model, the application server defended the application from attack, today that responsibility lies with the service itself. So it is more important to think about the security of your application when microservices are being deployed. Moreover, in such a model where you have you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of microservices perhaps deployed to multiple clouds, how do you even draw such a parameter? This is actually really challenging. So one of the ways to do that is to actually use an API gateway. The API gateway allows you to limit the aperture of what is exposed and allows you to manage the relationships between internal service producers and API consumers that are external. If you think about the security of a store versus the security of a bank or a high security office building, if you walk into a store, you pretty much maybe sometimes tell someone who you are and just walk in and you can walk to any part of the store and look at anything you want. But if you go to a bank, you most likely will have to badge in everywhere. And the bank is very aware of who's walking in, what their intent is, what they need access to, and will give you that ability to badge in everywhere. And that's the difference that is, that is actually happening. Microservices are sort of more a bank model. Sometimes this is called zero trust. So what you want to do is use something like a service mesh to manage and compose applications out of your microservices and use API gateways to expose only what's necessary and offload authentication and authorization decisions there, and then use infrastructure to manage the relationships between consumers and producers of data. Using a highly scalable and highly secure identity platform is actually a key part of your security infrastructure. You want to pair that with your API gateway and your developer portal. A service like Google Cloud Identity, for example, will scale to a very large scale. It handles all of Google's traffic. It allows you to get reports on users, tell you, tell you about your who's using your API, how they're logging in, and what they're using it for, inform you of malicious users, and also provide data into your security dashboard to get uh, give you a better sense of who's attacking your API. And also other things like two-factor authentication, stuff like that. Here's another thing I wanted to call out. One of the vestiges of the cookie-based model is a design that looks like this, and I'm sure you've seen examples of this in the past, where a client exchanges users' credentials for tokens with a service. The service, in turn, takes the credentials and sends it to an authentication server, which issues a cookie. It then heads on to an authorization server to find out you know, whether this user has access to this resource. Now, this is great. It works. It's fairly secure until the point that the services start to grow. Once the services grow and come up to the hundreds, you can imagine a situation where there's a lot of load on the authentication and authorization server. Not only that, they become single points of failure. And any additional latency that they add will impact the latency of your entire infrastructure. This is a design that's quite prevalent even today. So a lot of customers ask us about JWT tokens. And one of the reasons we use JWT tokens is for scale you put more of the onus of authenticating on the client. Have the client fetch an identity token from the OpenID Connect server, and then exchange an identity token for an access token 
with a particular service. On one hand, since the tokens are encoded and all the information requ required for that request are encoded into the token, every service is able to handle it, handle it independently, scale independently. And one small thing, if in the early architecture service one was compromised, the entire service is compromised because service one is accepting all the user credentials. In this model, you're actually using OAuth 2, giving out time-bound delegated access to the service. So if service one is a contact service and only the contacts were compromised, you actually can limit the damage of a breach because you only issued time-bound delegated access to that service. So the attacker only gets limited access for a limited amount of time to a limited amount of data, which is actually more powerful. This is one of the reasons we want everyone to move towards OAuth 2. So how do you bring all of this together? One of the retailers that we work with exposed their APIs and it was actually very popular. And uh, retailers actually have a lot of partners that help them. And these partners engage with them using APIs. So say a partner reaches out to a retailer and says, I need access to your APIs. The API, say product manager, needs to go to the security person and say, hey, give issue a key, please issue a key. And the security person has to figure out now how do I craft the access permissions so that you know the partner can you know get access and there'll be multiple rounds of trial and error? Then they have to issue a key. How do you get it to the partner? So the security person encrypts the key using, using their key and sends it to their manager and encrypts it using their key. Then they transfer it over to the partner and the partner has to find the, find the key. And then the partner leaves and they have to revoke the key. And then there's another process to unravel the entire exercise. What a lot of customers have done is they've deployed a developer portal. A developer portal provides you a self-service way of exposing your APIs, allowing everyone to check out what you actually offer, what services you offer, and then providing a way for you to register an application, get an API key, request for only the access you need, and allows you to build an approval workflow around it so that you can manage the different key approval workflows without having people in the middle. Just wanted to call out Mercedes-Benz. If you go to their developer portal, you can see an experience that's really wonderful. Uh, you can check out how you can configure a car using an API and also request for access to do that. The next thing I want to cover a little bit about is insider threats. A lot of car manufacturers, banks, airlines, and telcos have been compromised by insider threats. You can look it up on the news. One of the best ways to defend against insider threats is to first integrate your SaaS products, including your API management product, as well as perhaps the Google Cloud Console with your enterprise IT identity infrastructure. So have your administrators and anyone trying to manage the API program log in the same way as your employees do, using either two-factor authentication or whatever other security you have that gives you visibility in how people are accessing your program. The second thing you also want to do is really solid change management. Make sure that you understand who is exposing data, why they're exposing it, what they're doing with it, and you know, put some governance around it. In order to do this, we will expose a ton of information about changes happening to your APIs to the security dashboard. So you can integrate that with your other tools and get a, a, a holistic visibility into the changes happening. And so if there is something that was unauthorized, you can build processes to roll it back and also understand why these things happen. Last but not the least is spam and abuse. This is a growing area of concern for most internet properties today, and your APIs are subject to this. Google already handles a ton of this. Uh, we see everything from credential stuffing attacks that I talked about earlier, or something simple, like just content scraping. People just scanning your API to find out the prices of the goods you offer, just trying to brute force for fun. There are a number of tools that you can deploy to protect your APIs against spam and abuse. One of them is Cloud Armor. Cloud Armor is, is from GCP. You can deploy it in front of your APIs and limit um, the traffic from spam and abuse that actually hits your API backend. The other effective way to defend against spam and abuse is put more onus on the client to prove who they are. So using a service like reCAPTCHA that shows up on the on the website and gives you a client a challenge, like you know, find, uh, I don't know, like uh, cars on the road perhaps, is just a way to limit uh, you know, repeated traffic from automated actors who are trying to spam your APIs. So those are two things to think about. Again, data from automated actors, bots, good and bad, um, are visible to you in your Apogee Sense product as well as will be available at some point in the uh, API dashboard as well. So we covered a lot of ground today. Just wanted to summarize. 
API management is a key part of your security infrastructure, so you need to think about the security of it. You want to use data and metrics to drive your response to any of the threats that your APIs face. And if you start with the right architecture, it will help you make security seamless for your team. Thanks very much. Thank you. And with that, we are going to move on to questions. And let's see. So let's start with um, a question around compliance as the first one. And the question that we have is, uh, is Apigee, HIPAA, or uh, PCI compliant? Matt, Joel, do you want to take this one? Sure, yes. Uh, we have, we are able to operate in, in a HIPAA and PCI compliant way and um, happy to send more information on that if, if you're interested, but yes. Great. Uh, another question we have here is, my company uses a zero trust model. Can you describe some useful patterns for last mile security between Apigee and backing services? Yeah, hi. Um, so that's a, that's a really good question. Um, in a zero trust model, um, as I said before, you want to propagate the same identity that the users maintain to your backing service. You know, there is no concept of a backing service really in a zero trust model, they're all treated the same. So what will happen is, say you exchange your um, credential for a token, you will flow that token through Apigee and all the way to your backing service. So the backing service will use the same token to authenticate and authorize access. Now, there is a uh, area of concern that is between Apigee and the backing service. So what we've recommended is to use two-way TLS just to make sure that there is trust between your Apigee, your Apigee front end and your backing service. So you just want to make sure that you're getting the token from a trusted resource. So there are many ways to implement trust. You could do two-way TLS if uh, you worried about certificate expiry and other such issues. You can use uh, just API key-based security and just make sure that there is trust uh, between the services. You also want to have a, a way to rotate certificates and rotate the keys so that trust, there's no such thing as trust forever, right? So you want to keep the you know trust for maybe a year or something. Uh, so that is something to think about. I hope that helped. Thanks, Joe. Uh, another question we have here is, what languages are supported on Apigee? So Apigee supports um, callouts that you could write in Python, in Java, and also using Node.js and JavaScript. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, next question. Can you describe some OAuth patterns which allow identity to be propagated to backing services while using last mile security? Um, so if you're, you know, if you are in a model where um, Apigee is communicating directly with a backing service, you would pro propagate the same token right through Apigee. Uh, you might want to add some analytics to your Apigee instance to give you some uh, idea into who's using the service. That's always useful also for audit trails and things like that. Uh, but basically you treat, uh, as a backing service, you would treat uh, the Apigee infrastructure as a machine access, so there's no user, so you'd use uh, client credentials grant, very typical client credentials grant to um, you know ensure that there is trust between Apigee and the backing service. You mentioned Apigee can be used to monitor who is doing what, how, why, et cetera. Could you please share more information on how to configure this? Sure, so uh, as I mentioned, the data exists today uh, within the Apigee platform across a couple different uh, sets of logs, but as we move closer to general availability of our security reporting dashboard and API, this information will be very easily accessible. So feel free to reach out to your uh, Apigee contact if you're interested in trying these features out in alpha today. As I mentioned, there's uh, a, a dozen or so pieces of information we're making accessible today, but more than 50 are gonna be in the general, in the, in the V1 of the product. So definitely reach out and we'd, we'd love you to test it out. All right, then we have someone asking, what tools do you recommend to use for automated pen testing of APIs? So I'm not a very big fan of automated pen testing. And the reason is that uh, I find a lot of false positives with these tools. You're actually, in my opinion, uh, better off, or what I found useful, is that you're better off having a third party person actually pen test your APIs. Um, because then you have lesser chance of false positives, you don't distract your team, you actually fix issues and investigate issues that actually exist. 
um, and that I found to be more useful. Once you fix these issues, you could just write just regular tests to make sure that the issues don't recur. So that is, you don't waste you know money on a third-party penetration test or if they're going to find the same issues over and over again. So what we found to be useful is we take all the issues and we put it in a checklist. And every time there's a new rollout, we go back to the checklist and make sure we don't repeat the same mistakes. Is it possible to integrate third-party OAuth server with Apigee? Yes, totally. So uh, you can definitely integrate. Uh, there are many uh, design patterns for this. Um, you can check out the Apigee documentation on how to do this. You can use it in one or two ways. You can either have uh, the third-party OAuth uh, token provider provide the tokens and just have Apigee process them, or a better way would be to uh, integrate it with your developer portal. Uh, so have the clients and uh, sort of have the clients be created inside Apigee and have them propagated over to the third-party identity provider and have Apigee issue the tokens uh, from clients that are issued by the developer portal. But you can find more on, 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 uh, on our website. Uh, we have a question about the dashboard that Matt talked about. Do existing customers get this new feature that is being rolled out, or do we have to pay separately? Yeah, good question. So this will be included for all Apigee uh, Cloud customers, and it will not be it will be, be available at no cost. Great. Uh, is there a specific reason for not having a refresh token for client credentials? Um, so that's a very specific question. Um, the way I think about it is there are two types of, of OAuth policies. One set of OAuth policies are for machine-to-machine -machine interaction, um, and that is typically client credential. And one set of uh, sort of uh, flows is for um, whether the user involved. It's called three-legged OAuth: the user, the client, which is a web app, and the backend. And so the reason you use refresh tokens again is because you don't want to disrupt the uh, user experience and have them log in. And you also want to reduce the time that uh, each access token is issued for to re reduce the attack cycle. Now in client credentials, what you would do is you just get a new token. You have already have the client credentials. You just get a new token. So there's no need for a refresh token. There's no need for another credential to issue a new one. You just reissue the same one again. And that's, that's the reason why it isn't. Thanks, Joel. Uh, we have another question here. I've been using Apigee with API key and not OAuth. How do I get started with OAuth? Yeah, so uh, I believe in there is a page that has a couple helpful links, and I, that is one of the links there. So take a look at the, um, the there's a resources center. Um, so yeah, please, please check, take a look at that. Okay. Is it possible to integrate messaging system with Apigee to have RESTful service behave as fire and forgot? Yes, that's totally possible. Um, you can uh, use a whole host of techniques, but the most common would be to write a call out to your messaging service. Uh, it really depends what you're trying to message. If you're trying to just send logs, there is a message logging service. Uh, that is sort of fire and forget. If you want to you know, integrate data, then you would just use a call out to call out to your messaging platform and then uh, integrate it that way. Uh, in addition, Apigee is, um, has something called extensions that allows you to integrate with, uh, with third-party uh, messaging platforms as well. Okay, Matt, there are a few questions here about the dashboard. Uh, can you talk a little bit about when it will be available to existing customers and uh, what it is called? Sure. Um, so we're just calling this API security reporting. Um, we're not just calling it a dashboard because there is an API. It is accessible through API to integrate with other uh, security uh, reporting tools. It is available for existing customers. You can reach out to your, your uh, support, your, your sales rep to get uh, early access today, um, but it will be available for all customers in Q2 uh, and GA with the full feature set uh, in the second half of this year. What is the best practice for Apigee Edge authorization roles to be mapped to internal IAM and RBAC systems? Um, so I'm not sure if the question is related to the API or to um, the Apigee um, management system itself. And I'm not sure if this is an on-premise deployment or a cloud deployment. If it's on-premise, um, then we have a um, a way, I, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but we can get back to you. Um, there is, in, in the documentation, you will find a way to write custom Java code that will allow you to make a call out to your enterprise um, LDAP or uh, identity management solution to find the groups that this user belongs to. So you can write some custom code. Um, if uh, you know there's sufficient interest, you've seen, we're seeing some interest around 
integrating uh, the Apogee authorization model with with enterprise authorization services. Um, and you know, I think it would be best to bring it up with your team, and so we can escalate it to uh, to product management and have that prioritized. Okay, great. I think we have question uh, time for maybe one or two more questions. The next one is, do you feel OAuth is su sufficient for identity management for API? Um, yes, it is sufficient. We, we use it internally at Apogee as well, and uh, a lot of Google tools also use OAuth. Um, so it is more than sufficient. Uh, you want to make sure that you follow best practices. Uh, obviously, you want to deploy, um, you know, and, and obviously there's an RFC on best practices. So you, there's, there's a whole list of considerations uh, that you can follow. Uh, in addition, you want to deploy a very highly available, and highly secure identity management uh, platform. Uh, we recommend Google's Cloud Identity for that, uh, primarily because Google has been in the space for a long time and um, and uh, completely uh, protects its infrastructure from a whole host of attacks. Um, in addition, um, you know there are other use cases that may be specific and maybe what is not a best fit. Uh, but primarily, most of the world is moving to a model where uh, users are being issued time-bound uh, delegated access to data. So you do not anyway, anymore have a system that just gives you a cookie for access to everything, the entire website. Most access is now time-bound delegated access. It's becoming even more uh, important because of uh, regulations like GDPR and others. And so uh, the model that OAuth prescribes actually uh, fits the model of the world more accurately. That's something I believe. So I think it's more than sufficient for, for protecting API. Okay, last question. If I have more than one ID, which are primary to me or mandatory, how would I map in Apogee in terms of generating OAuth token for any client? So I don't think an identity management system or Apogee really uh, optimizes for whether you have one identity or multiple. And so you would treat every identity differently and you would get different tokens for the same client. So there's, there's the concept of a client identity and there's a concept of a user identity. So in this particular case, you have two user identities and one client identity. And on OAuth, the OAuth client is issued a token on the user's behalf. So the one OAuth client will get issued a token on one identity's behalf to act as that identity, so identity A. In the second case, that one client will get issued a token on the second identity's behalf, and that's identity B. So it really doesn't you know, matter whether one is primary or secondary or one is mandatory or not. You just have to be able to understand, I guess, which client you're using and what identity and then differentiate it based on the, on the token that's issued. I'm not sure if that helped, but um, that's sort of what I understood. Great. Thank you, Joel. Um, all right. We will start wrapping up. So a couple of reminders. Uh, our next webcast is on April 25, and it is around managing APIs in a hybrid and multi-cloud world. So please, um, if you're interested, uh, tune in to that. And also, uh, uh, April 9th to 11th, which is coming up really quickly, is the Google Cloud Next conference. Apogee has several sessions, um, as well as many announcements that we are making at that event, um, specifically to the security reporting tool that Matt mentioned. Uh, we'll be uh, talking more about that uh, during um, that week, so watch out for announcements. Uh, also, please check out the, uh, the resources section in, in addition to several helpful links. We've also posted um, uh, an ebook that you can uh, tune into. All right, that's it. Uh, that's a wrap. Thank you, everyone, for joining today and for asking a lot of great questions.